Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this sermon. Our prayer is always that God would use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. It's also our hope that this sermon would not be used to replace God's plan for authentic relationships in your life through a local church. If you aren't already a member of a local church, we just want to encourage you to step out in faith and join a church somewhere near you. Thanks again for checking out this sermon. We pray it is a blessing to you. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, you are amazing, and we are grateful that, that you um, have drawn us here today. God, I pray that your word uh, would do a work inside of us as we look at the life of, uh, of Abraham and, and your interactions with him, Lord God, that it, we would uh, understand and be inspired by your goodness and faithfulness and by uh, his faith and obedience. Lord, do a work in us today, every single one of us, in our hearts and minds and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, Abraham, a very key person in Scripture, as uh, you look, if you've read, maybe not through the Old Testament, maybe you've read through the New Testament a bit before, you'll see him referenced often because he is the one that God in the Old Testament made a covenant with for his elect people, that, that through Abraham there was going to be this, this people that are God's people, that he would show himself great through those people, that, that all nations and all people would be blessed through Abraham. And so that's why we're spending more weeks on Abraham than we did on the others. And for three weeks, we kind of camp on Abraham. And one of the verses we're going to look at today is, is a key verse in Genesis and really in Scripture for us to understand uh, that we are made righteous by our faith in Christ Jesus. And so um, let's just jump in. We're going to look at Genesis 15 is where we're going to start today. Um, we're going to kind of look at Genesis 15, 16, 17. And then 21 and 22, I think, is where we'll go. So 15, I'm going to read verse 1 through 6, and then I want to talk about it with you. Some of it we'll actually read and, and, and chop up or unpack as we go, and then some of it I'll just tell the story because we don't have time to read through all of it today. Genesis 15, if you have your Bibles. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Listen to this. Here's the verse. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. We'll get there in just a minute. Let's unpack these first six verses today. If you're taking notes, write righteous credit. And then maybe as a subnote, write reward with no receiver. Reward with no receiver. In verse 1, it says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. After this. Um, this is directly after Abram had saved Lot. I don't know if you remember last week, if you were here, Lot gets taken. Um, when the town that he's in um, is besieged and, and they take all the possessions and the goods and the food and the people. And so Lot is taken and Abram goes after him with 318 trained men, goes after him and, and takes over these kings, gets Lot back with his possessions and then has a conversation with the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. And it was a, a cool interaction um, where uh, one of them is this... Um, kingly priest, and so we see a foreshadowing of Christ Jesus, and then the other one uh, kind of says, you know, give me, give me some of this, you keep some of this, and, and he says, I will not take anything from you. I've sworn before God that no one will say that they made Abram rich. Basically, that, that God will get all the credit for any good that happens to me. And then after, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, or fear not, Abram. I am your shield. And, and literally that word there also um, means sovereign. I am your sovereign, your very great reward. Now, although it is very true that God is our greatest reward, is God himself, um, the context of this scripture is probably best understood by a different translation of the same scripture. Uh, so there's, there's another translation that says, I am your sovereign, 
your reward will be very great. So although, yes, God is our great reward, we need to understand that right here, God says, I'm the one that's sovereign. I'm, I'm, I'm your, your God, and I'm, your reward is going to be very great. And you can understand it because after that, Abram's, Abram's response to that is, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless or shall die childless? And the one who will inherit uh, my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. So God says, like, after this, he says, Okay, I'm your sovereign, and there will be a great reward for you. And Abram's response is, Not who cares, but basically, like, you're going to give me a reward that I have to give to someone else. Like, you're giving me a reward, but you haven't given me anyone to receive that reward. And and so, kind of, what good is that? You're going to give me all this great stuff that you've promised, but I have to give it to somebody that's not even my own. And so you can hear his heart in this conversation back and forth, and then God's great response in verse 4 and 5, Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son, who is your own flesh and blood, will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up to the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, you can't. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now listen to this verse. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. How how are you going to do this? Like You're going to give me this reward. There's nobody else to, to give it to. I don't have any sons that will inherit this goodness that you've given me. I have to give it to someone else. And God says, no, there's going to be one through your own flesh and blood. And the Bible says that, that he believed. He, just, he had faith and he trusted that God's word was good and valid and true. And in that, it was credited to him, credited to him as righteousness. In the New Testament, specifically, we're going to look at Romans chapter 4. Paul talks about this. He says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's the understanding that it is by grace alone, through faith alone, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That the, the righteousness that was credited to Abraham was because he believed that God is good for who God says he is, and he fulfills all of his promises because he is faithful. And his belief in that, his trust in that, um, is, is what, why he was credited as righteous. And that all the things after that, the obedience was because he fully believed that God is who he says he is and he always comes through. So he acted in a way that came into alignment with that belief system. Okay. That it is not by our own works, but it's, it's our, our faith in what God has done. That we are justified by believing in Christ Jesus, not by the works that we can do. And now in that belief of Christ Jesus that motivates us is grace-driven effort that we would want to walk in obedience because of the love that we have for a God that we believe is who he says he is. But not so that we can earn something that we could boast before God. Come on. And really, if we ever think that way, we just need to look in the mirror for a minute and realize like boasting before God is kind of a silly thing. Anything and everything that we can ever do or accomplish that makes us feel like we should boast, we need to realize came from him in the first place, so how could we boast? Now to him who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. In Romans 4, 18-25, it says it like this, against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed. I love that. Against all hope, in hope he believed. And so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. We'll see that in a little while. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. 
that he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. <clears throat> Listen to that statement. Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's so awesome. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was deli delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification, that we would be righteous by putting our faith in Christ Jesus, that we would be justified, not by any works that we can do, but by our faith in him. That's seen in Genesis chapter 15 by Abraham, who we're going to see the one that God made his covenant with. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need some water. So we see this uh, beautiful um, righteousness credited, and we see how it applies to us even now. And then it goes on from there, and there's this promised possession where, where God, I'm not going to read it all to you, but in Genesis 15 there, God says, I'll give you this land to take possession of it. And Abraham says, how will I know that this is, this is true, that you're really going to give this to me? And, and God says, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a goat and a ram and a young pigeon and a young dove. And so Abraham does that, and he cuts the heifer and the goat and the ram in half and he lays the halves apart from each other and doesn't cut the birds in half. And then these birds of prey begin coming down trying to get on these animals, which makes sense because he just cut them in half. There's blood everywhere. There's meat on the ground. And so uh, these birds of prey start coming and so he's got to keep them away. And so he's, he's protecting these things that God has told him to sacrifice and lay out in this way. And, and, and then the Bible says it's sunset. <clears throat> Excuse me. That Abram falls into a deep sleep and a thick, dreadful darkness comes over him. And then God gives him this, this amazing prophecy. Um, and so he, he has just said, I'm going to give you this land that you can possess it. And then he says this, this prophecy that we'll see fulfilled through Scripture as we continue through the Old Testament. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. He's talking about Egypt. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. This is so awesome. God says, um, okay, I'm going to give you this land to possess. And, and, and Abram says, how will I know that? And he, so he lays out these offerings that God tells him to lay out. He has him in this deep sleep, and this, this dreadful darkness comes over him. And God says, okay, you're going to go to this land, and your people for 400 years are going to be enslaved. I'm going to bring them out of that land, and I'm going to punish those that enslave them. And in doing so, I'm going to give them the possessions of those people that they were enslaved. We know, if you know the story of Exodus, that's what happens. That they leave with all these goods to go back to the promised possession in that promised land that, that, that God says is theirs. And so he says, you're going to have this land, and you're going to have these, all these great goods to bring there. There's going to be some struggle along the way, and, and here's the reason you're not going to have it right now. He says, you, however, uh, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. This is amazing. God says, you're in this place right now, and you're around all this wickedness, but it's going to get even more wicked. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to this other place. You're going to be enslaved for a while, but in that, I'm going to show myself as good. I'm going to bring you out of that place with possessions to come back to this land I told you to possess. And then when you come back, you're going to be my righteous hand in dealing with the wickedness of the Amorites. You're going to drive them out. You're going to have this land. You're going to have all this stuff. I'm, I'm your God. It's awesome. <clears throat> and then it says directly after that, a smoking fire pot with blazing tor a blazing torch passed between the pieces. So he gives him this prophecy, and, and then this, this fire pot and, and this torch pass through uh, between the, the sacrifice, and it's God making a covenant. Um, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, promising the land to his descendants. So it's God showing um, that his presence coming through and saying, like, I've said it, now I'm showing you, this is me saying it, there it is. Okay, stay with me. I know we're going through a lot. That's the end of chapter 15. It goes into chapter 16. It's kind of interesting. What happens is Abraham's wife, uh, 
has still not been able to become pregnant. And so she wants to continue on the family line um, with Abram and says, Abram, since I haven't been able to conceive, why don't you take my slave, my servant, Hagar, um, and why don't you have a kid with her? And Abram um, says, okay. And he takes Hagar as, as a wife, and she conceives, she becomes pregnant, and when she becomes pregnant, she, she starts to despise Sarai, his, his original wife. So Sarai comes to Abram and says, what have you done? I love that. That's classic. She tells him, do this. This is how I want to, maybe I can have a family through my slave. And he does it. And then she's like, what did you do? And he says, isn't this your servant? Deal with her how you want to deal with her. And so she's actually really mean to Hagar. And so Hagar flees. And as she's running away and, and, and she's pregnant, the angel of the Lord comes to her and says, what are you doing? And, and she explains what's going on. And he says, go back. Submit yourself to her again, um, and when, you, when your, your son is born, uh, name him Ishmael, which is God hears. And then she makes this statement, which is awesome. She says, I've se- now I've seen the one who sees me. That God sees me in this struggle. I had to be on the run, and God sees me, and now I, I've seen the one who sees me. So she goes back and, and um, becomes again subservient to to Sarai, Abram's true wife, and, and gives birth to this son, Ishmael. And Abram is 86 years old when he has this son through uh, Sarai's slave, um, Hagar. And then we get to the, the next chapter here, chapter 17. I know it's like story time right now today. That's just what we're doing. Go to chapter 17 if you have your Bible with you. I want you to see this. I'm going to read the first 11 verses, and then I'm going to tell you the rest. When Abram was 99 years old, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. I love that statement. I am God Almighty. Like, that's a power statement, if you're wondering. I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will increase your numbers. Abram fell face down. That's a common response when God shows his power. I am God Almighty. Yes, you are. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my, (laughs) we're going to get to this in a second. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. <clears throat> There's some things I want to pick out in there. So if you're taking notes, right, today things change. Today things change. God's covenant, and, and the Lord appears. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared and said, I am God Almighty, which, again, that's El Shaddai, um, God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Now check this out. Abram fell face down as God, and, and God said to him, as for me, so God's about to tell him what he's about to do. As for me, here's what I'm going to do. And then we're going to see after that, he says, as for you, and tells him what he needs to do. As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which is exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, which is believed to be father of many. No longer will you be Abram, you will be Abraham. Um, That's so awesome. God gives him this name before it's actually happened. Like, this is who you are. I know you're not there yet, but that's who you are. 
And we need to understand that for ourselves. Because oftentimes what happens is God tells us that the old you is dead and gone, the new you is here, like it's a new you. Um, and we still know we're still dealing through some of the old stuff. And so it's hard for us to believe that God, we are who God says we are. Abraham has to believe that. There is still, he's not a father of many nations yet. And he has to believe that God is good for what he says he is. And that we are who he says we are. Hmm. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. Now listen to this. For I have made you a father of many nations. Now listen to these I will statements. I will make you very fruitful. Remember, he says, as for me, I will change your name. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. To be your God, the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you. And I will be their God. I love that. That God makes it very clear. As for me, this is what I will do. I will, I will, I will. And God is faithful to who he says he is every time. He's good for his promises. Keep the covenant. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. And I love, he already told them, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. So the circumcision is the sign of the covenant, but God is the one that makes the covenant. He says, you walk before me blamelessly Walk faithfully and be blameless, and then I will make this covenant with you, and I will do all the things I said I'm going to do, and as a sign of that, um, you undergo circumcision. And he tells them every generation after this uh, that comes up, whether it's your own offspring or even foreigners that are a part of your household, on the eighth day after their birth, they're to be circumcised, and now everyone right now is also needs to be circumcised regardless of age. Then he says, your wife, Sarai, her, name's going to be, her name is now Sarah. She's going to be a mother of nations. And from her, kings will come into existence. So kings will come from her. And the Bible says that Abraham falls on the ground and laughs about the fact that Sarah will have a child because of how old they are. These amazing things happen. God is making this covenant. I'll do this amazing stuff. And you know what? Also, Sarah's name is now going to be Sarah because you're going to have a child through her. And he's, <laughs> because it's hard for him to grasp in her old age and in his old age how that's going to happen. So he kind of tries to make a deal with God. And he says, okay, God, I get it. You want to bless me through Sarah? He kind of laughs like she's too old and says, how about this? The son that I already had with the slave girl, um, um, Ishmael, how about you do the blessing through him instead? God says, I will bless him. I will bless him. And there's going to be uh, lines that come through him. But to be clear, your wife is going to have your child. Sarah is going to have your child. And the covenant is going to be established through the son that you have with her, Isaac. God says, don't. Uh, you can laugh all you want. This is what's going to happen. And so he... he Makes that very clear, and then Abraham obeys, and that day, it says, that very day, he circumcises uh, all the males in his household, which is a, a very large group of people, including himself, at 99 years old. Okay, I'm not going to get into details. I'd like you to keep your breakfast down. So we see this amazing life of, of uh, Abraham. We saw that two weeks ago, this call that God had on him and, and, and his response to that. The last couple of weeks, we saw how great of a guy he is that God uh, worked in him to save his nephew, Lot. And, and we saw ourselves kind of in maybe different places in those stories. And then today, we see the covenant that God made with Abraham that's going to follow through the whole rest of Scripture and that we see it was built on um, for us a belief in God being who he says he is. That's where, where the righteousness was credited to him. And, and the same way that righteousness is credited to us. 
As we put our faith in Jesus, he takes all of our sin and gives us all of his righteousness that we would be in right standing with God. Between chapter 17 and we're going to move to chapter 21 is the, some of the stories we already talked about last week where three visitors come to Abraham and uh, they get ready to go wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. He pleads for Sodom to try to save his nephew Lot. Sodom and Gomorrah are wiped out. Lot is saved through that. There's a weird story we didn't get into last week between Lot and his daughters. Um, you could re- read that, but it's kind of sketch. <laughs> you should read it. There, you, you got a Bible, right? We got Bibles here if you want. I just, based on the time I have to get through the characters in Scripture, I can't get into every part of every story. There's also another part there where... Um, Abraham and, and, uh, has this interaction with King Abimelech because, again, Abraham says that Sarah's his sister so that people don't come after him because she's beautiful. Uh, and there's another kind of interaction there similar to like what had happened before. Um, and then we come to chapter 21 where I just want to read uh, a couple of verses because we see the, the, the promises of God. We see the prophecy of God about in Egypt what's going to happen. We see the covenant that God makes. It says, this is going to be your possession. And, it's, and, and the, the covenant as far as um, the, the, the blessing through you and, and through your offspring is going to come uh, through Sarah. It's going to come through Isaac. Uh, in, in chapter 21, 1 through 7, it says this. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, I love that, the Lord was gracious as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. <laughs> this is so cool. The Lord was gracious as he had said, and the Lord did what he had promised, because that's how he rolls. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the, uh, the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. So they're saying this is such a miracle that people will laugh at the fact we're so old and now we have this kid. And so we see that there's this uh, promise fulfilled and that God is faithful in fulfilling his promises that, okay, Abraham, you're going to have this kid. Through you, nations will be blessed. We know that, uh, that, that Christ is going to come through this. Uh, and, and we see in the Old Testament, like God's people and his elected people, Israel, and we're going to get through all that. And it's amazing and it's beautiful. Um, and so now we see it. Like God promised it. Now we see it. Isaac is here. Like, like what? talk about celebration. You're old. You've always wanted to have a kid with your wife. You finally have. Not only is this just having a kid, the son with your wife, but this is also God's promise fulfilled and now you have this lineage of of the of descendants that god says are going to be massively blessed that are going to be his people set apart for him and I'm, he's going to be with them and be their god well, that's amazing and then we get into chapter 22 and in chapter 22 the bible says this sometime later god tested abraham and that's not He didn't tempt Abraham. He tested the faithfulness. He tested um, the genuineness of his obedience. How many know that sometimes we obey for our our own good, not necessarily to be obedient? It's not genuine obedience. Our motives are sometimes off. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, exclamation point. I'm sorry, but anytime God says something with an exclamation point, I see that as earth-shaking. Here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Hit the brakes. So right here we see like, okay, it almost sounds like God is going against his own moral law, but we need to understand the intention of what he's doing. This is a test. This isn't a command that's going to go all the way to fulfillment. This is to see where is your 
trust and, and are you genuinely obedient? Is it about the giver of everything good or about the gift that he has given? Is it about the promise and now are you so wrapped up in the promise that you forgot the one that promised it that you're supposed to stay connected to? And we do that. We do that. And so we, we pray, we pray, we pray for something. God shows up and, and it comes through and then we get it and we forget God because we didn't really want God. We wanted his stuff. And so there's this genuineness of obedience that's being tested. He says, Abraham, this is what I want you to do. You finally have that son. The promise is here. The covenant is, is, is you see it playing out. And, and, and here is Isaac and you love him. And who do you love more? I want you to take him and go up on this hill. I'll show you. And I want you to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, you need to know the whole story. If I stop there, you'd be like, God is messed up. There was never an intent. It was never going to happen. He was never going to allow it to happen. But what he did do is see if Abraham was obedient and more in love with God than with the promise. Okay. Early the next morning, I love the faith response of Abraham. He just did it. It doesn't say he had this long conversation or worked through anything. God says, that, that son that you love, Isaac, take him and go sacrifice him. Early the next, next morning, he woke up early. He got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, they had to travel for several days. Like, son, wake up, we're going somewhere. Servants, wake up, we're going somewhere. We got the wood, we got the supplies. Get on the donkey, let's go. Let's make this walk, let's make this journey. For a couple days, they're just walking with them. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. Now, this statement is huge. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Wait a minute. God just told you to take your son up on this mountain and, and, and give him as a, a burnt offering, and you just made a statement that seems to contradict that because you just said that your son's coming back with you. Listen to the trust he has in God. In Hebrews, it tells us a little bit about this. In 11, 17 through 19, it says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be, offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking... He did receive Isaac back from the dead or from death. So he says, the servants come with him. They get to this place, three days journey. They get there. They look up on the mountain. He goes, that's where I'm taking him. Hey, you guys stay here with the donkeys. You can't come with us. We're about to do something you can't be a part of. And, and me and the boy are going to go up there. We're going to worship. And then we're going to come back to you. And his reasoning for saying, oh, we're coming back, even though they were supposed to make this offering, is God is so awesome. And he told me the promises through him. And he's faithful to that. I might not understand exactly what he's asking me right now. But I know that the outcome, he must, he must expect me just to kill my son and then he's going to bring him back to life and we're going to come back. What? He's like, well, yeah, because God does what he says he's going to do. Like if he said he's the promise, then he's going to be the promise. So I don't understand exactly what this step in the journey is. It doesn't seem to make much sense, but I'm going to be faithfully obedient and I'm just going to do what he told me to do. And I guess God's just going to do something I've never seen him do before. Like he's just going to come through in a way that I, above and beyond what I've seen because it's got to happen. So I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to be, be obedient, whether it makes sense or not, because I know that God is good and that he is good for his word. And can I just say, oftentimes we see God's commands and we go, that doesn't make sense to me based on um, these other pieces and these other parts. Like, uh, you know, certain things are hard that way. Like understanding that, that making time for prayer actually makes the rest of your time make more sense. Like something like tithes and offering is really hard to grasp when we're trying to like function through life and we go like, how could it make sense for me to give towards God as he, you know, is providing for me for these other things? And, and it, a lot of things don't make sense when we just try to make sense of them in our, in our natural mind. 
But they make sense when we say God is faithful and if he said it's going to happen, it happens that way. You know, it, do, it doesn't make, to the outside world that it hasn't been revealed to them who God is, prayer does not, like the fact that I'm going to go into a room and just talk to the creator of the universe, it's not hard for some people to grasp. It seems like gibberish, like you're talking to a wall or something. The fact that I would open this word and say, this is the word of God, is hard to grasp. Why? Because if God hasn't made it a revelation for you, and there's not an understanding that this is his promises, and he's good for what he says, and, and he is who he says he is, then it doesn't really make sense. And so he's asked him to go up and do this burnt offering, and, and he says, I mean, even though maybe it doesn't make since it makes sense that like God, God has to have a plan in this. He works all things out for the good of those who love him. And I love him. In fact, I love him even more than um, the son that he gave me that I love. And so I'm going to honor him with what he's called me to do. And so he goes up there to do this, believing that it's great. He, he reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So he says, I'm going to go worship with my son and I'll be back. And now it's go time. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, this makes sense. Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That makes sense. You said you're gonna, we're going to go worship. We have all the stuff to do this offering. Hey, Dad? I noticed uh, we don't have a lamb. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. First of all, I imagine Isaac needs some counseling after this. Some PTSD or something happened. Like this is an amazing story of a man that believed in the faithfulness so much that he would be obedient all the way to this? He gets him all the way up there, bound on the wood, has the knife in hand. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham! Usually if they say your name twice, that's urgent and important. Here I am, he replied, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now catch this verse. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Your hands were open with everything. You showed faithful obedience and it's been confirmed. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, or a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Instead of his son, that there's this stup substitution. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. That God provides what is the necessary sacrifice. Did you hear me? God has provided the necessary sacrifice that Christ Jesus would be the substitution, the atoning sacrifice in our place, on our behalf, that we have freedom, that we have righteousness, that we have wholeness and holiness because Christ Jesus took on himself what was due for us. Hmm. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. I love that. You've heard people say, I swear to God. God swears by himself. Because he swears by the highest thing. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, 
that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Listen, because you have obeyed me, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited him as righteousness. In the book of James, James says that faith without works is dead because there's a, there's a completion of faith that happens in our obedience. That we're saved by putting our faith in Christ Jesus. But what he's saying is true faith leads to movement. Because if I really believe that the creator of the universe gave of himself to save me the one that has sinned the ones that have sinned against him that are his enemies dead in our sin deserving of wrath for what have we have done and that instead of receiving that wrath we receive his love and his grace in Christ Jesus because Jesus received the wrath that was due for me in mind that in view of that if I truly believe that that Christ Jesus came that God came to the earth in, in, in Jesus Christ lived the perfect life that I cannot live in my own strength died in my place for my sins defeated sin and death being raised three days later um, and then ascending into heaven to sit on the throne that's a big thing to believe in fact it's so big that something that grandiose if I truly believe that it would move me and he says that the, the the kind of the confirmation of your belief is the movement that it produces you're not saved by the movement but a saving movement in you will move you okay and he says because you have obeyed me there's a part of being a Christian that is about obedience, not because that's what saved us, but that we are saved to obey. That in us being saved, we should now obey him. We can't do it in our own strength. It's only by the grace of God. We're going to fail along the way, and we're going to constantly have to depend on his grace and his mercy as we are being perfected to look more like Christ Jesus. But to, to completely negate the fact that we're called to obedience is wrong. Okay, I don't know if you heard me. To think that our works save us is wrong. To think that we're not called to a good works and, obe and ob being obedient to God is also wrong. In fact, that's part of being a disciple. Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that today. It's going to be amazing. And teaching them to obey all that I have commanded of you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is what I hope that we grasp out of today. Not only understanding the story of Abraham better, but the things I want us to really pull out and see in this is God's faithfulness all the way through. God's faithfulness to his promises, the fact that God says, uh, uh, does everything that he says that he will do. That we can look back at the history of who God is and it helps grow our faith knowing that he's good for what he has promised us in a resurrection in him. That he is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. God is sovereign. God is good. He is merciful. And that we can see in Abraham, we can see a, a faithful response, a call to obedience that he responds to and obeys. And I, and I pray and I hope that we would all walk with open hands, regardless of what God calls us to move in, believing that he would only call us to move in something because he has a plan in it to show himself good and to continue to, to affirm and strengthen the faith that he has put inside of us on this journey. And so I would dare to ask us today what is it that God is maybe calling you to or placing on you that is clear um, that that maybe we aren't walking in obedience with that it's time to start obeying hmm. and it's not to beat us up but to call us to something better 
walking with God and watching the fulfillment of his promises as we do so. So this is what I want to do. I want to pray with us. And after I pray with us, we're going to worship. In fact, if you guys could stand with me right now and the worship team will come up to the front. I'm going to pray with us. We're going to sing um, praises to God. But don't go anywhere. We're not dismissed yet. Um, so don't leave. I'm going to come back up here, talk through a couple things, and then we'll dismiss after that. Um, but I want to make sure we have a time to just sing of God's goodness and faithfulness uh, together before we get out of here today. So don't go anywhere yet. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence God, I thank you for your faithfulness. God, that you work all things to the good of those who love you. Hmm. That walk according to your purposes, God. God, that in your faithfulness you have promised that your spirit dwells inside of your people. I thank you that you're here in us. You also say that you are with those that gather in your name. So, God, that your presence is here among us. That in your presence there's, there's freedom, there's great things that your Holy Spirit teaches and reveals. And God, I pray that in your presence right now you're doing a work in the spaces of our lives, Lord God. That some maybe that we've shared with others and some maybe that we haven't. God, that right now you're just revealing in us things that you want to talk to us about. God, I pray that you give us faith. That you give us courage and boldness to have instant obedience in whatever you would ask of us. God, knowing that you provide all that is necessary for the all that you have asked for. You are so good and so loving. God, I pray for clarity in people's lives where there might be confusion on what to do next and what, what move to take or step to take in different areas of life. God, I pray that you would confirm things that people are, are, are wondering about. God, I pray that you would bring healing to, to brokenness, God, physically, mentally, emotionally. God, wherever there's hard hearts in the room, I pray that you would soften them and turn them to yourself. Hmm. God, wherever there is bondage in the room, I pray that you would break that in the name and by the blood of Jesus Christ. That we are no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness. God, in areas where there is pride, where we get in our own way, God, I pray that we would remember your greatness and that you are sovereign and powerful. God, that we would not make it about our small kingdom of, of me, but of your kingdom, Lord God, that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in all circumstances. Huh. God, I thank you for the, just the peace in your presence. God, give us boldness to sp speak your word. God, stretch out your hand, we pray, and do miraculous things amongst your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing of his goodness.